Okay. Amen. So we recorded progress. I have to be nice now. <laughs> so why should be nice? Exactly. Oh, that's right. That was tonight. Okay. I, I remember I wrote him until we weren't sure uh Sunday because it kind of it's hard to tell. Yeah. We're coming to that one. <laughs> there you go. Okay, uh, we've discussed some of this before, but I won't go a little deeper, pulling off of what I did Sunday, like a child. And we're going to talk about the shell of pain. Huh? Oh, yeah, here it is. You need some? Just in case. I didn't know where they were. We're, we're men, we use our, our arm asleep. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, we'll go to Romans 8. Romans 8, verse, it, it's on the top there, printed, uh, 33 through 38. No, don't worry about what's in 9 1. It tricks me. Somebody like to read that out loud where they can hear you. <clears throat> who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of the Father who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for you sake, for your sake, we are all, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's, people said, amen. Amen. That, that's, that's a big mouthful. He lists all these things that, that, that he says is not going to separate us from the love of God. And you could also think about the flow of God and, uh, but we're going to be talking about today, the shell of pain, how that sometimes, and I'll explain that in depth in a moment to you. But sometimes we allow things from our past to block us, as we mentioned last Sunday about like a child, that uh, some people, because of their relationship with their earthly father, they have a tough time realizing their heavenly father's not like that. And, and a lot of times that, that there's a like a film over it that's blocking it. Man, and okay. Uh, we're going to keep going. First Timothy 4, uh, 1 and 2. I'll read this one. Now, the Spirit expressly said that in the latter times, some would depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, have their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, let me explain. I'll be paraphrasing some of this. <clears throat> but their conscience seared with a hot iron. I've used the example with you before. Like if I burn my hand right here with a hot iron, it gets healed, and then I burn it again, and it heals. I burn it again. Pretty soon, there's not feeling. I had to yeah. say calm over there. I, I don't want to interrupt this. And, and uh, it, pretty soon, I won't have the feeling in my nerves that I had before. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we realize that sin can do that. That's why the first time someone misses church, it don't. It really bothers them. And the second time, bother a little bit probably fifth or sixth time they forget it's even Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, because it's pretty soon it don't bother me anymore. Maybe they're committing certain sins. And, and uh, we see that in our society, it's just crazy. And, uh, but the thing is, uh, I want to go a little deeper than that, that not only can sin separate us and cause our conscience to be seared where we don't have feeling, but I'm also going to share tonight that that shell of pain, I'm paraphrasing a lot of what I have written here, that shell of pain that I'm talking about tonight can cause you not to feel the pain of others. 
uh, because of what you've gone through. It, it, we'll, we'll look at this closer. And so uh, I, I talked already about speaks of sin and other experiences that can numb our feelings, but people tend to grow a shell of protection around themselves that alleviates much of the pain coming at them. The only problem is that that bars that protect us also imprison us. The same bars we put up protect us from being hurt because we've been hurt before. Mm -hmm. it, it, it keeps us from being hurt, but also keeps us from touching others. The same bars that imprison us causes that. And the shell we develop uh, to hide from pain, uh, the same shell insulates us from feeling pain that hinders us from feeling the pain of other people. A lot of people are just like, it's not there. I'm not going to think about it. Because if I think about how they're hurting, uh, guess what? I'm going to start hurting again. If I think about what they went through, I'm going to start going through my experiences in my mind again. And so, um, we tend to wear masks. We're talking about those masks. Uh, maybe maybe it's, it's time to unmask. The masking hides our identity, also makes it impossible for people to form relationships with real us. A lot of people, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, a man of God, uh, Chuck Swindoll, many years ago, uh, wrote a very good book on masking. In fact, my associate pastor taught a whole series to our church, an adult Bible class. We had adult Bible class, then we had the regular service. We've always had heavy teaching, and, and uh, but uh, he did a whole series on that. But we tend to wear a mask. You know, I talk about some people that have pain can religion. You know, they get in front of the mirror on Sunday morning, they spray it on, they smile, maybe it sticks. They look good, they come to your house, praise God, hallelujah, how's everybody doing? But as soon as they get away from there, it cracks. And a lot of times we wear those masks because we're, we, we don't want to interact. We're afraid of people knowing who we really are. Mm -hmm. And it keeps us from going into relationships with people, but it keeps them from knowing the real us. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes intimacy, with intimacy, you're gonna have to show your scars. Mm -hmm. that, that's a mouthful there, it's not in your nose, by the way. Mm -hmm. But in true intimacy, so then you have to show your scars. You know, just like I shared with that, that, that doctor today, I was on Zoom with him. And I told him about going, going to um, Jericho Island, Georgia, come out of Poland, grow, grown six inches of a leg cut out surgically, um, a, blind, a blind eye of a teenage girl, one eye, she had one eye blinded, popped over, she got up to testify, and I was crying. She told about her whole life changed. She you know, was about 13, 14. Uh, other legs grown out, tumors disappeared people being healed. And I get here and break, break my arm. Uh, I'm scheduled for Jekyll Island, Georgia, 50, 50 churches representing their organization. I said, why is this? Should I call and cancel this? I'm in a cast, broke arm, you know, surgery and pain. She said, no, just go anyway. So we went. They didn't know I get off the plane. I have my, my arm in a cast. And I heard a few people say, you know, he got a healing, big healing ministry. He's got a, he got a broken arm, you know, but when I started sticking the finger from my broke arm, with that cast on in deaf ears, the deaf ears are popping over one after another. They didn't care more about my cast or my broke arm because mm -hmm. it's all demonstrated. But see, uh, in that doctor that I was talking to today, he laughed and laughed and laughed. He said, the very broken part of you, you're sticking their ear and it popped. He laughed, he had the best time with that one, you know? And, and um, but the thing is, oh, sometimes we have to show our scars the true intimacy. And I explained to the doctor, I said, I don't walk on water all the time. I let people know, yeah, I've struggled with physical things. I had open heart surgery. I've seen people walk out of intensive care and totally healed. And I went through it. He's God. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I have no answers. But my faith is not in what I see in myself. My faith in what he did and what he said. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. ne ne never try to translate the Bible by your experience. Mm -hmm. Go to the Bible to find out what to experience. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and that, that, that's a powerful uh, statement there. And so um, let me read that little statement again. We tend to wear masks at times. Maybe it's time to unmask. The mask that has our identity also makes it impossible for people to form relationships with the real us. To be these sides can be very a very dangerous situation. I'm talking about the U.S. and the Israeli military. They understand this. 
and I think I may have shared, let me this with you before, let me share it again, <clears throat> um, that um, in World War II, they, they figured out that only 15 to 20 percent of infantry soldiers fired their weapons in battle because of the adversity in our society then of taking a human life. It's hard to believe, but that's, that's true facts. And, and um, uh, in World War II, only 15 to 20 percent of infantry soldiers fired their weapons in battle to take human life. You know, made a shot to the side, but they, they just had the adversity to take the human life. Okay, and so uh, the U.S. changed their infantry training, and by the Korean War, 50% of infantry fired their weapons in battle. The U.S. changed their training again, and by the Vietnam War, the figure rose of 90% who fired their weapons in battle. If I'd known that, I'd probably choke some of my men. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, you know, we, we had a rule, if you go the wrong direction, you're probably not going to make it home. Yeah. Thankfully, we never had to carry that out, but that was an unwritten rule among us. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the sea rations. I'll tell you all about the sea rations. Make a little light a minute here. We, we put our sea rations in a sock. They come in a box, and we didn't have K-Rash. We had a sea ration. We put them in a sock. We had two socks, and one had regular sea rations. The others had um, uh, the fruit and all the stuff like that, and we saved it for weeks to we had long sock hanging. It's fruit, and we we sit down one time and just gorge on that, just eat, eat, you know, the, you know, the little satisfaction. But if anyone had a long thing of uh, joes of fruit hanging out uh, on the back of the pack, we followed them on patrol. We had this other unwritten rule: if you get hit or killed, your fruit don't go. We cut that fruit off. We keep it. Yeah. And so if somebody had fruit, maybe we walk behind them, you know, <laughs> like vulture. You know, we weren't being ugly or anything, but just you know, it's funny. But <laughs> like the vultures I had on the deck, we we had COVID and vultures laying on the deck. I threw some old meat out. <laughs> I said, "This is a bad sign." I got photos of them. Yeah. <laughs> Those things are ugly things. I mean, the, you know, a nasty looking thing. But anyway, but the, the thing is. Uh, they desensitized the soldiers so that they could take human life. They kept changing their training to make it where I know when I got ready to go to Vietnam, I wanted to fight. I mean, I would charge a telephone pole, anything, light pole. You know, I wanted to fight. If they had not cut orders in Vietnam, I was volunteering. You know, I wanted to go. I had to fight something. I've been trained. I had to go. And, and um, you know, I got my money's worth. I actually got $50 a month more for being in combat. You had combat pay, a lot more now. The whole $50 a month, man, I thought, man, we doing good. <laughs> hey, man, there it is. I wonder where my receipt went today. I didn't pay for all that on my own card. Don't, don't tell my secretary. Oh, I know. Okay, and so even the next page, even medical personnel, law enforcement is trained to wear emotional mask. Uh, the, we're, we're trained. I was a law enforcement right this year. We're trained. Don't show your emotions on call. Mm. I mean, you, you see horrible things. You're like war, you see horrible things, but law for you see horrible things. And uh, I mean, uh, I've seen some even horrible child abuse. Uh, when I went on call the north end of Beaumont where I worked, and a little uh, six-year-old boy just come back from his other grandparents up the country. And his mother and grandmother was raising him in Beaumont. And he got there and he said, little Johnny took meat out of the pot without permission. They grabbed each one grabbed his hands, run the gas stove, turn on, put his hands in the fire until it went to the bone. When we got to the hospital, the, the look of hurt in that boy's face, it was just uh, horrible. It, it wasn't just because he's in pain physically, but the someone I love did that to me. And us as policemen, you know what we like to have done? Yeah. Wrung their neck right then, you know. Mm -hmm. You'll bring back the, the, hang, the hanging gallows or something, you know. But you can't do it. You got to try to act normal, but that's one of the reasons uh, the divorce rate among policemen is horrendous because they come home and they take the mask off. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And then they're like a raw nerve mm -hmm. and the divorce rate is horrible. And of course, the divorce rate was bad because of the infidelity among policemen. You know, the uniform that they used to say was a chick magnet. You know, we, even when I wasn't saved, I had offended off, you know, nope, nope, tell my friend, nope, I'm faithful to my wife. And, but that was, that was very unusual in uh, law enforcement because they're attracted to the uniform. I don't know why. Uh huh? Could be, no telling. I just run the other way. <laughs> and I've shared with you before about that petting dog uh, at the bus stop. I know I've shared several times with you. 
But let me do it again. I was in Ohio. Uh, Mandy used to come through here and teach some marriage classes in Troy. Um, and uh, But uh, when he was a little kid, they had a, uh, at the bus stop for the children, this dog every morning showed up and all the children pet it. And the dog was wagging his tail so happy. But one morning, this, this dog got hit by a car. It's still alive. It's hurt. They tried to pet it, tried to bite him, bite them. And they couldn't, the little children couldn't understand why, why the, the sweet petting dog trying to bite me. It was hurt. People in your life that a lot of times they're going to try to bite you because they're hurt. Okay. We'll go through some of the characteristics of this. And so uh, we're talking about your shell of pain. If we're not careful. We, we will put something over ourselves, whether it's a mask and you're never going to see the real me or uh, something else to desensitize us that I, I'm not going to notice your pain. Uh, I'm not going to get involved with your pain. I got my own. And so, um, so now the wife, uh, a wife who has been raped or molested uses that shell of pain to protect herself from her own husband who she can trust. A lot of times, I'll keep it generic, but in intimate relationship, they have a real problem because they look at men as that man that did that when their husband's not that man. And I, I, we've dealt with this with people that the husband's like, I don't, they're nothing but good, you know? And uh, it, it's sad. And so the thing is that they're still projecting that on others. Like I talked about the father image uh, last Sunday. And some I've shared, I know before, but uh, one of my mentors years ago uh, taught me that some of the most powerful men and women of God you'll ever see have known great pain in life. But, but they, they, they got healed and they turned their, their pain to gain in the kingdom of God. But a lot of people, they go through great pain and they, they want to stay a spiritual cripple all their life. You know, just, you know, don't touch me. I mean, you, you can find people around the church. I mean, you, you don't have to be deep in the spirit to know this person been hurt horrible. You know what I mean? And um, don't, some people you don't want greeting at the door. <laughs> like I said a while back, I've seen people in churches greeting people at the door look like they need a muzzle on or something. <laughs> Put a muzzle on. <laughs> they will hurt somebody or something, you know. Never mind. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Get out of here. Where's the next church at? And so um, instead of getting bitter, we can get better. And I, I, I really believe uh, I can't explain it all. But it's almost like people that's known great pain in life, just cordial three and eight, my own opinion. I feel like they have a capacity in their human spirit for more God than someone that's never known pain. Uh, I, I, I don't understand it all, but but uh, that's the way I, I mean, I see it in my eyes of faith. That's the way I look at it. And uh, and you try to look at I mean, we, we shared some with you a while back, you know, uh, uh, Maria Edder uh, and a bunch of them, what they went through. I mean, I mean, even uh, Smith Wigglesworth. I mean, all the people he raised the dead. He had a grown daughter, 100% deaf, and never did get healed mm -hmm. under his ministry. I mean, I don't know. You had to see which one you want to read, but he pulled a lot of men out of coffins and raised them from the dead. And some of them he actually pulled out of the coffin, slammed against the wall. They fell down. People on the side said, "Live." The third time, live. They choked, and they ended up walking out of the building together. If you read some of his stories, you get different records. How many raised the dead? I don't know. I wasn't there, but he raised many from the dead, but he still had a daughter, hundred percent death that never got healed. Explain that. I can't, he's God. I'm not, I don't know what was going on. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I could throw in some subjections. So, I mean, I mean, it, it may have been a way God had, said, hey, I'm going to have to somehow keep him on the ground. I don't know. You know, I mentioned uh, even me, the accident I had right out here, breaking my arm right after Poland. My first trip to head, third heaven was in Poland. And went to third heaven, saw the great cloud of witnesses, saw people, uh, et cetera. And, and uh, I saw some things that the late Bob Jones saw in heaven. I, I never heard of it, what he saw, but I saw people wearing the clothes of the century they lived in, dressing those clothes, walking, walking together, grass and flowers. And I found out later from a prophet that you know the late Bob Jones had wrote about that. He had that same experience, one of many trips to heaven. He, he, the late Bob Jones went to heaven over and over. Okay, and uh, 
I still got to pull those ladies at candlestick, try to get more information to share with y'all. We talk about that hotel somewhere we're at. You and I know you, we, we, we put up some stuff on YouTube and, but anyway, uh, we'll, we'll get in it later. But these ladies will keep going in and out of heaven at will. And sometimes they go into heaven, come back in different set of clothes. Right. And, and uh, there, there's the missions of the spirit. It's a very, very solid ministers that have, have, have shared on that. Uh, so I've been on Sid Roth, but I don't get too deep in that. But the thing is, Bob Jones, one time Todd, Todd Bentley went to me, Bob Jones said, Todd, do you want to go to heaven? And see third heaven? He said, yeah. They give me your hand and grabbed it. They both were in third heaven just instantly. Okay. There's dimensions. Don't stop it where we at. Yeah. There's dimensions of the spirit. We haven't even touched good yet. Yeah. You know, there's so much more of this, you know, and, and probably very shortly, we're getting ready to start getting deeper, deeper, deeper. That's why when I quit, record and make it available. <laughs> Some people just couldn't handle it probably. Somebody like to read um, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. Somebody else? It's, it's written there for you. Okay. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life is in you. Okay, let's keep staying on that scripture a minute. <clears throat> Notice he said, he talked about the persecution, things you went through, but verse 10 is always cared about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. In other words, when we've been, we're talking about that hurt and that capacity a while ago, but a lot of time when we've gone through a lot of things, been hurt, and, and, and overcame it, didn't get bitter, but we got better, forgave people to hurt us, and, and we're going through that, we're, we're actually carrying the marks of the dying of the Lord Jesus in our body, we're being persecuted because of that, and, and also because of that, re, look at that very carefully, um, um, the last part of verse, let me read all verse 10 again, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That, knows that word that. The life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. In other words, because we're dying, because we're being hurt, we have the right attitude. We're, we're caring about the marks of the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that dying, life is coming out of us. The resurrection of the life is coming out of us to others because we, we've experienced some things. If it hadn't been a bed of roses, we've been hurt, we've been persecuted. I mean, my, you know, even in Vietnam, I've been caught four times by communist police. My wife, no, you got arrested the second time with me every time God gets us out. That's a bad feeling. You know, we started going in there. We, didn't have, we have an embassy now. We did not have an embassy in Vietnam. It'd be like going to Cuba or something today, you know, <laughs> or Cuba. And, uh, but, but anyway, uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, we've gone through a lot of things and, but yeah, I think what we went through is nothing compared to what some of these others have gone through and what they're going through right now, your brothers and sisters, I told you about the, the Hmong tribe in Vietnam. Uh, there's some of the, the mountain yard people It's spelled H M O N G pronounced Hmong. The H is silent. And, and uh, 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 one of my meetings in North, uh, East Cambodia, uh, in the, on the Vietnam Laos border, I was in one of their their uh, meeting houses, and their doors are like round, like a birdhouse, like a big birdhouse. Their doors are all around. I don't know why. There's got to be a reason. I haven't studied it out yet. You may have to go do some construction there and fix their doors. But but anyway, uh, they, I got ran out of there by the police, not because it's illegal for me. It's okay me preaching in Cambodia, but they're mad at the tribal people there. The six tribes. Still, uh, animal sacrifice. That's where I said you go. It feel like actually pins sticking you in the arms. The witchcraft is so thick, 
And after a couple of days, you don't hardly notice it. When you leave there, you feel it like a breath of fresh air. And I'm still in Cambodia. And that's, that's heavy spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. They still have animal sacrifice there. Uh, there's people in tribes that have never seen a, a light bulb. If they come to the village, they say they'll stare for hours like this in a light bulb because all they ever had was fire. And there are villages there that, that, that they still uh, wear no clothes at all. They wanted me to go by motorbike, by elephant to the Laos border and spend two or three days one of them like that ministering. But if I get caught in Laos, it's 12 years in prison preaching in there. And, and uh, that last time I checked it. And so, you know, I, I thought, man, I wonder if they really know the border. I'm not sure if I want to travel that far and hang out, but, but not hang out, you know, <laughs> 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 minister there. I mean, that didn't sound right. <laughs> We'll go hang out with y'all. <laughs> but um, you, know, you have to love missions. But but the thing is, you know, what, what I've seen, I think, is nothing compared to, to what some people are seeing right now. I mean, those nations. And the Hmong tribe I'm talking about, when they run me out, I found out that some of the Hmong were sneaking in from Vietnam across the Cambodian border. And they got caught by the Cambodian soldiers. They turned back over to uh, the Vietnamese soldiers for a little bit of money. And they, they would take many times the men and immediately cut both their Achilles tendon and leave them in the jungle, drag around till they die. The women, they keep uh, like eight to 10 days uh, violating them. And then usually at the end of that, cut their breasts off and leave them in the jungle to die. Some of them they beat horribly and sent back to their village in Vietnam. When they got there, they're really unrecognizable. And th this happened while I was ministering, okay? And, and so, you know, we think, man, we have it hard if, if we had a quarter inch of snow the other day, like we had half the church showed up. Oh my God, we're being persecuted. <laughs> I see something white. You know? <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, like I said, I used to come back from missions and walk through my own church and, and just walk by. By the time I got to the altar, I just fall on it, just cry and sob it out loud because I was so just broken hearted that the people I love so dearly did not know the God I knew. They had no clue. You know, just Sunday, you know, a little dab of do you. And uh, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart what I see among religions in America right now. I know there's a good good places, I'm sure, but I hadn't found a lot of them. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so at times, so the, I'm writing on that scripture now, St. Corinthians 4, right below that. At times in the work of God, the very people you labor to help get off drugs, other addictions, the only reason they're still married because you spent countless hours helping them put their life back together. Uh, sometimes they would turn on you and maybe leave a knife you bought them in your back. <laughs> maybe you may have bought the knife they stabbed you with, but you're just going, I've told you before, you got to love them, forgive them, and go the next one that needs God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? You have to do that. And this is where the agape love of God um, comes in. It's unconditional. You cannot get bitter and turn your back on the next hurting person. The, the, the agape love of God is unconditional love. Uh, you can't earn it. You can't get good enough to get it. It's unconditional. See, a lot of people in this world is, you know, scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Do something for me, I'll do something for you. You know, or, or they do something for you. What do they do, Joseph? You owe me. Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah. You know, but some people feel like that with God. Okay, you owe me. Mm. You know, I gave somebody a flyer. You owe me, God. No, you already paid the price. And so a lot, there's a God be love, unconditional. I mean, think again, the, I mentioned a while ago, the story of the prodigal son. You know, he came to himself in the pig pigsty. Mm -hmm. He said, my father's house, there's everything I need. And he starts coming back. The father sees him and it opened arms to receive him. I mean, this guy took his inheritance early, spent all right in the living, wasted it, ended up in a pig pen. You think about it, if he was a Jew, that's a bad place to work probably, you know? <laughs> and uh, the first pig pen I ever put up in Texas, I didn't think about one thing, the prevailing wind direction. And I was sitting in my, my little dining room and all of a sudden, I had to move the pig pen way to back. That's why I, I used to eat those things. Now, I like pigs. I mean, they make a good pet, I'm sure. They're, I mean, they're really very smart and everything, but uh, that's all I do with them now. You know, I, I, I can pet a horse and a pig and enjoy, but I can't already touch a dog or a cat. 
<laughs> Don't ask me. You know, I pray for you delivered. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I know where the cat thing came from. I, I was in Duke, smothered with cats growing up. My mother fed every stray in the neighborhood, mm. falling over them. David, go get the cat. Just ran in the house under the couch and throw it out. And you couldn't hardly get through the door. And I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. Plus, no, he's allergic to them. And our friends the other night at the prayer meeting Saturday night invited me to go to their house after I, I said no I saw on Facebook you just got a kitten yeah I said my wife's allergic to it <laughs> she looked like a blowfish <laughs> so fellowshipping out in the yard or something maybe yeah that's that an interesting trip appreciate y'all coming I mean I didn't know it. I looked up and uh, seven of us from Team Supernatural was all at the prayer meeting Saturday night. I thought I was going to need my passport and things so far away. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so it, it was good. And so uh, you meet people in life. Uh, okay, let, let me go up a little bit. Right under God be love. It's almost, it almost seems to me that, for, that the very rip in our heart is what God uses to infuse us with a greater anointing. And someday I, I would draw you some pictures on that. I have some revelation on that. It's almost, uh, you know how like I teach on the blood of Jesus and I draw that the, here's the body of Christ, the blood, and we're members in particular. But it's almost like that when us as one of those members or gets hurt, there's a rip in our flesh or whatever, that veil of our flesh is ripped. Is almost that the blood of Jesus that's all around us is infused in us a different way. Uh, I can't explain it all, but it just, I, what we read a while ago, we know that going through suffering for the name of Jesus, not because we did something crazy, but because of Jesus, uh, being persecuted for him, uh, et cetera, uh, somehow that dying, bearing the marks of Christ dying in our, in our own life, uh, releases the life of God in a greater way out of us. We're feather, fair weather Christians, uh, you don't see much coming out of them. You know, we're talking about. Also, I was thinking of the scars as evidence of healing. Yeah. 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 It could be, but it's almost like when we're ripped like that, when we're bleeding out, it's almost like he's bleeding in too. Mm -hmm. if going by what Paul said about, you know, bearing those marks and stuff. Yeah. And, um, yeah, scars is evidence of healing. But you can't really heal from them. Right. Mm -hmm. But th think about it, even your natural body. You, you cut yourself and you see like a little glistening look on the cut and it becomes a scab and stuff. Mm -hmm. One time when I was a policeman, a guy uh, was shot shot to death on uh, one of our streets and uh, I ended up in the funeral home where they were working on him. And uh, we had to go, you know, making him just paperwork and all. And he had like three shots through his heart area. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, there were 22. So th there was not big wounds or anything. But I kept, there already pumps of fluid in him. But I kept seeing, uh, and it was right after I came to God, he testified about our little country church. But I kept seeing that fluid build up on that uh, area of the wound where it went in. Because it did look no more than like he scratched himself with a fingernail, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because the small bullet going, I didn't roll him over to see how it looked coming out. But, but uh, you'd see that um, uh, film, like you see on a regular scar, it come and all of a sudden it would just roll off his body like a tear. And it really touched me. I thought, you know, that, that, that healing that Jesus gave him in that body was not working anymore because life had left. Yeah. It, and you had to realize when you see that healing, even a regular cut, just natural healing, mm -hmm. that that's actually really supernatural. When life leaves you, it don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And it is, it, to me, it is an awesome message to me, you know, Okay, uh, and now you will meet people in life that are totally imprisoned by the wall they erected because of hurt. We're commissioned to set the prisoner free. These walls take many forms. Some are unfriendly. You know, you're kind of like the old pet and dog that was hurt, biting. They're just unfriendly. And they're unfriendly because they're afraid of people. They're, if I get close to somebody, they're going to hurt me. Everybody they've been close to hurt them in life. And I want you to realize there's, even like I said, Sunday, it would have been uh, a woman been hurt uh, by, by a husband or 
has been hurt by a wife. Uh, there's some men and women out there that will not hurt you. Don't judge them all by that. Don't judge your heavenly, every male by your heavenly, your earthly father hurt you and your, your heavenly father that won't hurt you. A lot of people don't trust God because of their distrust for their earthly father. And, uh, you know, and that could type in both directions there. Okay. Um, some are unfriendly. Some always have an excuse why they cannot be involved when needed because they're, they're afraid they're going to fail. For others, especially women who have been hurt by a man, their walls are now weight on their body that many times a woman been molested or raped will consciously or subconsciously overeat to gain weight and not realize they're protecting themselves against men. It's very, very common. But you look in the eyes. See, if they're not healed, now a lot of people have been hurt that's been healed. I, I, don't, I shouldn't be picking that up if they're healed. But when they're not healed, I look in their eyes, I see them. But let me just teach you all a little lesson right now. Uh, have, have you know this, this deep in the spirit? You know people that, that's on uh, heavy tranquilizers, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see that look in their eyes? It's almost like a film looking deal, a weird look. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I see the same thing in, in women that, that have been molested and not healed. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a look of insanity. Mm -hmm. it is, and I see that there's some insanity involved there. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that. If they've been healed, I don't see it. But they're not healed. I can walk to the mall, with it, well, a real mall, go to Albany, the mall has stores in it. You know, <laughs> and I, I can't figure out, man. We were there the other day in Albany, man, stores everywhere, people everywhere. And, and uh, you know, you go to other places, they're everywhere. What happened to our mall? <clears throat> Dried up. <laughs> what, what, the, what they do to our mall? <clears throat> yeah. But but the thing is, I can walk through the mall and pick it up. I can look at someone I never saw before. That, that woman's been molested. She's been hurt. She's still hurt. And a lot of times they'll go into other relationship as a relationship trying to get fixed, but that's not the answer. And so... Um, And, and and just be very honest, talk about eating. There's been many times in my life that I've and I'm trying to work on it. I catch myself emotionally eating. I get under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't drink, don't smoke or grope, but I overeat. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You know, th think about it. You know, I thought it would grow here get everybody's yeah. attention while I'm preaching. I don't drink, don't smoke, or grope. What do you say? <laughs> I wake everybody up. Yeah. Poor Pastor Josh, you gotta put up with me again, maybe. <laughs> and um, I had to find out. Uh, also, other someone the other one was coming in too. Maybe they got mixed up. I don't know. But anyway, uh, but uh, the thing is, um, I get a lot of stress, and, and uh, a lot of my life I run to alcohol, cigarettes, um, uh, stuff like that. But many times, even after being a Christian, I find myself being a lot of stress and pastor, and I find myself just. I mean, gorging. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even hungry anymore. I mean, I was actually hurting. But I, I had to realize, wait a minute. I'm trying to get to a feel-good moment to ease the pain I'm feeling with the emotional pressure. I'm just being honest. So it works for men, too, okay? So, Josie, you skinny. <laughs> I'm picking on I'm just picking. Every time... Every, Thank you, dear. Yeah. Every, every, every time I lose a few pounds, I tell my wife, I said, Oh, I got a patient. What's wrong? I said, one rib on one side hitting the other side. Oh, you should eat yeah, it. Not that, you know. And I start trying to tell skinny jokes. You know, you know you tell no skinny jokes yet, David. <laughs> <laughs> feel your pain, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have to keep tightening my belt up, but. I had I had not I had to quit tightening up so much because it was hurting my knees. <laughs> you see when it big <laughs> you look, I'm on the third notch. Yeah, you are, you can't walk. <laughs> okay, everybody walk. <laughs> Try to use me. Yeah. I used to have an uncle who always has waistline up here, you know. Did I pull out way up? She called me his name, you know, Uncle So and So. <laughs> Just picking on her. Anyway, okay, we're almost through. But I like to throw a little humor in to wake everybody up and a little lighter. And so, uh, the, 
at the very bottom of the page, the very people Paul once hated had tortured and killed for not renouncing the name of Jesus. It's the very people he ended up preaching to and loving. Love must be the motivating factor. Um, let's stop there one moment. I'm going to read the rest in a moment. But think about Apostle Paul. Uh, he had Christians arrested, tortured, and some killed, thrown in jail and killed because they believed this one named Jesus until Jesus got his attention on the Damascus Road. Think about it. That, that turnaround. But also, I want you to think about something else. He used in the Bible, I got over here. He, he point this way, that, there, he's moving. But he, he used his testimony, what he used to do, to, to reach sinners. You know, I used to have him tortured, killed. I, I had letters from the, chief, the high priest and bringing them. And I did all this stuff. But then one day on that Damascus Road, a light shined. But see, Paul was not crippled from his past. Mm-hmm. See, I, that's why I could, I could, I talked to y'all about stuff and you hear me testify about war. You can ask her years ago, I couldn't even talk about it. I mean, I couldn't even, I mean, the basic testimony you hear, people didn't hear it. I couldn't talk about it. Where that, that's, that's big with a lot of soldiers that can't, a lot of times they can't talk about it because it's still not healed. Another reason they don't talk about it, there, there's this saying among soldiers, where you're really in combat, you, never, you wouldn't ever be able to talk about it. And if you're like, well, I don't want people to think I wasn't really in it, so I'm gonna just clam up. Mm-hmm. It's like a control deal. And a lot of people had that. I heard that over and over, you know, and when I first got back, I couldn't talk about it. But when I got healed, guess what? I talk about stuff that I can't normally talk about. You know what I mean? It just, uh, I could not do it. I, you know, I couldn't get it out. And, uh, and, uh, and so it's, um, Paul was not a cripple to his past. I could use it as my testimony, but to bring people to Jesus, let them know, hey, there's hope for you. You know, I always tell people, God can save me, he can save anybody. Mm-hmm. Amen. I mean, Amen. You know, kind of like Paul, you know, the chief is a sinner, you know, but God reached way down. You know, way down that Mary Clay, the Bible talks about. And so there's a reason, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter is sandwiched between uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. That has to do with the gifts of the spirit. And uh, th- this is very, very important. Uh, to understand that that uh, if we're driven by hype, we'll never be consistent. Mm-hmm. I've seen so many people go to a to a meeting. Um, uh, let's use an example. When Noah and I first, uh, shortly after we came to God, we heard there's a a, a, a bus ministry a seminar uh, in Beaumont where you'd be a police. And we're already living up the country, about 50 miles away. So we went to that. We, we were very excited about it. So this is something we can do. Went by and got my pastor permission. And we started a bus ministry. And the whole three years in our home church before I went to Bible College, we worked that bus ministry. So the other day we convoy. We didn't have a bus. We had to buy a bus, work on a bus, drive the bus, clean the bus. I mean, the teenagers come to my house, help us wash it out. We'd wax it and stuff and, and just have a good time, cookouts, a hamburgers, hot dogs. And, and, um, and then we went to Bible College. They shut it down. One thing, we didn't care which side of the track we went on. Mm-hmm. And the, that back there, there's a lot of racial prejudice, a lot of this side of the track, the black people, this side of the white people. We didn't care which side. Mm-hmm. We went and got children. Mm-hmm. And those, some of them old saints been away for 40 years, need to get out of the way. Yeah. And, and uh, they, they hated it. You know, man, what are you doing? We were in that little country church way up over 100, uh, mainly with a bunch of our kids and stuff. And we loved it. They loved us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we do everything we could. And, and uh, but the thing is, some people go to something like that, they get hyped up. I want to do it, I want to do it, and they never do anything because you would hype won't drive you love will. Yeah. What we do in the mission field, a lot of people hear the glory stories. Yeah, that cripple got up, it walked, and it blinded eyes popped open, that cancer opened up right here. Kingston dead was raised right off, off field court in the basement of, under the Kingston alteration base where we we're meeting at that time, and they hear the glory stories. But they don't realize how much work there is and how much hurt and how tired it can get exhausted. Like one time I was there when uh, my friends, um, uh, Sandra and her husband, uh, my San Antonio, uh, they knew a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine, and they wanted to come and know he was coming. And all of a sudden, uh, Sandra said, my husband don't want to come. And, and know he found she couldn't come. Go. I said, no. I said, you cannot go if your husband don't go. 
you know, even though we had a lot of people that just can't go. And then, so he came and met me and they, they did a great job there. In fact, that's one of the meetings that uh, the, the uh, young man started praying, received the message of the Holy Spirit, started praying perfect English. Did not speak one word in English. Just like the book of Acts, say magnifying God, glorifying God in perfect English. I, I, I heard it in my own ears. It's real. That man didn't speak any English. But they had me three different meetings all over the place. I think about 1, 1.30 in the morning, they got me back to my hotel. I couldn't even see straight. I thought, oh, you can't take me like that again. You know, and that's several years ago. You know, it'd probably be harder now. I mean, I was out doing my, I cleaned the whole house, power washed the whole house yesterday when it hit 62. And I, I'm, I'm still kind of licking wounds, you know. <laughs> I'm not a young puppy anymore. And, uh, but the thing is, it's got to be love. You do what you do because you love people, you love God, you want to see the manifestation of God, and you go through horrible things. People hurt you, people would cheat you. I mean, I got taken advantage of so many times when I first started, but now I'm pretty experienced, it's pretty hard to rip me off over there. I had someone in one country a while back tried to, I won't work with again. You know, God bless him and wish him the best, but uh, he saw my last dollar go through. <laughs> Amen. I had one in India. I had good ones in India. I worked with, first time I went to work with, I wouldn't work with him again. He's come right through here before. He slept in our guest room before. And, and uh, he, he comes into America and he goes to the big Southern Baptist church and does not believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They, they believe it's a, of the devil. And, and, and he's got the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, but he'll go preach messages against the Holy Spirit, against, against healing. They get, I mean, ten thousand, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, they got big. They got big pockets. They got a lot of money. Those people, and he knows where to tap into it. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, you hypocrite! <laughs> just you know, I just God bless him. And working with him was a headache. And that's my wife. I mean, it was it was it was a horrible thing. But anyway, uh, God still moved. That's where the guy that had some open his head open like that until he started filling in. We have a video of the skull sort of filling in it. And, and uh, so blinded eyes, open cancers. He'll, he he wants me to go back. He begs me to go back there. But I blocked about everything I have. I don't even know, want him to know I'm in India. Because a lot of times they'll turn you in because of jealousy and get you kicked out and, and blocked. We can no, never go back here. So big ministries cannot even go into India now because of that. They've been turned in by other Christians because they're jealous. They weren't getting the money. It, you know, I don't, I don't think God's real happy with that. But the thing is, uh, I want to work with real people. Mm -hmm. and, and God's blessed me in that. But that love chapter, it has to be love. You're going to get hurt. People are going to hurt you. People are going to lie on you. Uh, people are going to walk out. Uh, one time we run like 130, 140 consistently right there. Start building the actual building because of that I mean, we're filled up. The sanctuary only legally sat 100. Had the hallway filled, the, the little Sunday school rooms filled. And my social pastor lived in an apartment that we later uh, lived in. And they had the children in there. 130, 140, crammed in just the long building, you see, not the other part. And we started building that and the expense of that and everything. It's suddenly a Jezebel spirit. Uh, and people start saying, they're in witchcraft, get away from there. Calling people up on the phone, get away from there. Uh, doing the work of Jezebel. And we went from 130, 140 down to 23 and about eight or nine of them with my own family. Not only did Dr. Crowd down, you know it does the finances. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so, but you just have to love them anyway. God bless them. Mm -hmm. You know, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you when you leave. Mm -hmm. But God bless you. <laughs> Amen. Sorry. That's Arkansas style. <laughs> But, but anyway, uh, if you don't have love, that's between chapter 12 on gifts of the Spirit, chapter 14 on regulation of the gifts of the Spirit, in between chapter 13, the love chapter, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I become a sound and brass and a thinking symbol. If I give my goods to the poor, if I give my body to be burned, have not love, I'm nothing. If love, the agape love, unconditional love of God is, is not your driving force, uh, you, you'll run out of juice in a hurry. Mm -hmm. You won't keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that has to be it. And at the same time, we had to be careful. Uh, I had to make full proof of my ministry. I can't go everywhere somebody wants me to go, do everything someone wants me to do. 
I had to be sensitive. Word of God want me. I talked the other day again in the other class about decoys. Be careful with decoys. Because they'll get take you and suck all your time. You chase them and chase them and chase them. And some of them are about, now about to serve God. You know, there's somewhere along the line that people get hungry. If you invite them to the buffet, they're going to come. You know what I mean? And uh, all they want to be spoon-fed at home. And just like I talked about the lady the other day that used to hang on to my pulpit, make the sign of the cross. When we first started church, we were in the living room of our house. And, and uh, But she had the idea, she got upset when people started coming in, more people started coming. Because she thought she was going to have her private priest and ephod, I guess. I don't know. Another man I had in the church here, one time we were baptized every Sunday, just multiple people were getting baptized. He couldn't be pastor. I got apologized. I said, what for? He said, I, I just got so angry. I said, why? He said, all these people coming in here and getting baptized and come to God. He was angry because he wanted to have pastored himself. Amen. We've got to be the agape love of God. It's got to be your driving force. No matter what happens, no matter what they do to you, no matter how bad they hurt you, how bad they lie on you, they cheat you, whatever they do, you got to love them and keep moving on. But don't chase. Remember, Jesus said, the shepherd leaves, and the 99 goes after the one sheep. He never said to go after the one goat. We had people with Jezebel Spirit leave us and start calling people, don't... Uh, Pastor David and his son David, they're not real pastors because we left. They never come to look to see what happened to us. You know what happened to them. <laughs> and Jezebel Spirit walked out. <laughs> and, and I said, well, God called me to go after the one sheep, not after the goat. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's when I saw a while back, I told you, in the buffet. And uh, she saw Noya. She looked under the buffet line to see if that was really Noya. And she didn't know I was standing right there watching her do it, you know. And then she wouldn't look my direction like this. And then when I got ready to go, I went to the day the manager knows me. Uh, and, and I told him, I said, that lady right over there, I described it, that one right there. I said, I put her tab on my bill and I paid her for lunch. He just left. She, I never said a word, just left. Mm -hmm. What I was doing, I was blessing my enemy. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was doing good for those that just fight for you. It's biblical. It is. Learn to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Learn to do that and you'll be blessed. Amen. Praise God. So anybody have anything on this before we pray again? Anybody in Arkansas? Hey, anything about this? Any comments? I just have a quick question. When you, you made a statement, if we are driven by height, we... Oh, that's as far as I wrote it. Yeah, 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 if you're driven by height, uh, I use the term, you'll burn out. Uh, you, you, you'll just lose interest. You'll be excited. Oh, man, I'm going here, I'm going there. Like I said the other day, also, I forgot to put the big picture on me again. That's okay. But uh, uh, we don't have a big crowd today on here. But uh, anyway, uh, I told you all the other day in the class, I talked to a, uh, a man of God I know, not far from here, you know, about 40 miles away, a great, great man of God, pastor in a big organization. And uh, he's gone to multiple Randy Clark meetings. Uh, uh, and then he went to another country. One in Brazil is one of the other countries. I forgot which he told me where it was. I was Costa Rica or some, one of the other places with him. And this guy studies books and stuff. And, and, and after great men of God, I mean, good stuff he's studying. Okay. But he said, David, may I see a miracle maybe once a year. Why? But think about it. it. It's all here. He's a good man of God. Great man of God. It, but see, the thing is, I've told y'all, you, you may have many teachers, but you have not many fathers. See, as a spiritual father, I want to impart to people. And I'm working with other people you already know of right now that I will be important to them also as a spiritual father and bring them in a fast track into the supernatural. That I'm working on a whole new program right now. That I, I, sorry, I'm, ha I'm not trying to be real secretive, but right now I'm having to be very careful. I, I'm really warning the spirit to be very, very careful because what I'm doing when I get a certain place and I'll go ahead and share everything, but I've got to be very careful of word curses uh, out there, okay? And I don't even want to have to deal with some of that right now. And so uh, we're moving on. So I, I'm very involved. It's taking me uh, like five to seven hours a day more than my regular ministry stuff added to it. And so I'm like a dog chasing his tail. I, I, I am busy. 
and uh, but God is doing. I'm I'm reaching out, and I, I've had some real good contacts with men of God, and some great conversations. I mean, and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, kind of find what floats everybody's boat, and you know where they at and stuff. But people, I, I want to be. I want to influence influencers mm -hmm. that would take what I'm putting in them and run with it into their in their area of expertise where, where they work. Amen. And that, that's so important. And so it, it's deep. I'm learning a lot. Of, I'm having to study stuff I never learned before. I wish they taught some of that in Bible college. <laughs> Amen. I said Bible college, we had two hours on the gifts of the spirit. When in three years of Bible college, we had two hours on the gifts of the spirit. Okay, that's it. And hard to read in that. <laughs> Talk about a little bit, you know. But um, anyway, God, God has a lot. Don't let a shell of pain. And, and tonight, just ask yourself if there's anything that we read this over the scripture, you know, what can separate me from the love of Christ? You know, let, read all those things, but is there anything in your past that would separate you? To go back to Sunday again like a child. But is there anything, just say, but well, you don't have to answer out loud, please. But just, is there anything, just ask yourself, there's anything that would keep you from just going full blast in the things of God? Is there any hindrances? Is there anything, is there, may, are you guarded somewhere that, you know, I'm afraid somebody's going to touch that spot, it still hurts. If I get too close to one, I'd be close to people that hurt me before. And you can't imagine how many I've been close to it got hurt by. I mean, people, you pull them off drugs and alcohol, get get them get them married. And uh, what what one set of, of people I worked with, right after they got married, I mean, within three weeks, they walked into my office and said, we got to talk to you, Pastor. Said, what? They said, we want a divorce. I said, don't come talking that D word in here. And they're still married. They didn't the, say they're in bad spiritual condition. But, uh, you know, um, I told them, hey, you, you want to make this work. And uh, they're, they're still married, you know, very much in love with each other. Unfortunately, I keep seeing pictures on Facebook, different cigarettes in their mouth again, because suddenly they didn't need any leader. They got down there, just free range chicken. Amen. There's a lot of fox out there. Don't be a free range chicken. <laughs> you know, we need some covering. And so, you know, this, this is a spiritual father type relationship we have with the, uh, your, your like inner circle is team supernatural. And even in school is supernatural. Some are there just uh, curiosity to hear, but uh, they're, most of them do not have a close relationship. That's why when I see a real service heart, some clothes that really desire, then I would be glad to pull them in. Some that's been in, you're not really in anymore. It's kind of on the fringe once in a while. And, um, you know, uh, I hate to see it, but I already told them what they need to do to be used to God and you know, just stand up, put your big boy pants on, here's what you got to do. And, and uh, so I'm very plain with love mm -hmm. and we love everybody. We want to use everybody we can, but, but it's important in this group not to bring people in that just want to, you know, take a little taste and smack their lips. So that's nice. And, and, um, and people that would run everything that's going on out there, but never use it. Thank God some of them are using what they're getting. You know, they're going to different meetings and stuff. And and Julie want me to go minister and you pause when they start doing it in a diner. And uh, those guys they brought in, she brought in Sunday to church. In fact, Pastor Josh walked by me downstairs and said, David, that man is still on his knees up there at the altar. We pray for him. <laughs> yeah. I guess a big guy, big tall guy. Yeah. It was okay. Yeah, you know, but anyway, uh, Pastor Josh said he's still on his knees up, up there. And I told Julie later about text. She said, yeah, I had to go get him. <laughs> but I mean, the power of God hit him. That, that's what it should be. I mean, he got into the presence of God. He made, I don't know if you ever been there before. I hadn't talked to him. I don't even know what all happened. Maybe you know more. I've never seen him like that. But no, yeah. But, but anyway, when, when uh, I think John and I were praying for him, I believe it was, and somebody else may have been too. I can't remember. But he went into a presence of God. And that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. Things should happen. Yeah. Amen. 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 So God, God's doing something. Be praying for everything coming up down the road. I don't know what all is happening. I know Annie Elm is supposed to come in. If I, um, 
I was asked, uh, asked God to hold me, asked me, um, I had to look at, I had to look back and text what weekend it was. They want to know we would not have a school to supernatural that morning. So we'd have two services. I said, it's fine with me. Let me know. Keep me posted. You know, well, it looks like that's the same weekend as Long Island. Or Long Island. Oh, it is? Okay. I didn't realize it. Okay. I had to look back at his that's text. Yeah, yeah, I look back exit. Maybe I have a look back exit tag, text, so there won't be no problem with cancer. That you know, won't be. <laughs> that works, yeah. Yeah, that works. <laughs> we'll go be the school of the supernatural. <laughs> so let's pray, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, and worship you. God, we magnify you above every name. Lord, it's not by might. God, is not by power, but it's by your Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Lamb of God, in each one right here, right now. God, if there's any shell of pain, if there's any kind of membrane blocking the full flow of your spirit, Lord. Uh, God, from past pain, past situation, past relationships, in Jesus' name, Lord God, to heal us. Heal us, Lord. Uh, that the bomb of Gilead pour over us, Lord. That the healing bomb flow over us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, heal us, Lord. God, we, we all have a past out there, but the past does not have us anymore. I am free, Lord God. I am free. That whom the Son shall make free is free indeed. We thank you, Lamb of God. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Praise God. Have your way. Amen. God bless his own. Uh.